Well, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks, thanks, Gavin. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a conversation today, and uh, really I want to recognize the thought leadership that uh, HP has been providing, and for the support that you've been driving uh, at, with through the Catalyst Grant. Um, there's a lot of really exciting work that uh, we know the Catalyst projects are doing, and today we want to have a conversation about how we might rethink sort of the way that educators uh, do their professional development. How do we both connect and inspire them? And um, I started today's uh, conversation with a quote from uh, the, national, the U.S. National Education Technology Plan, uh, which is on the screen, saying educators must be more than information experts. They must be collaborators in learning seeking new knowledge and constantly acquiring new skills alongside their students. And, um, you know, we're specifically uh, focused on a STEM, uh, improving STEM access. Uh, in the President's, uh, President Obama's State of the Union address last year, uh, he set a new goal in the United States of preparing 100,000 new teachers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, over the next 10 years, and he urged people to make teaching a career choice and challenged Americans to respect teachers as nation builders. So this is a very much a big uh, goal. It's a big challenge. Um, we also think it's a big opportunity. And um, what we want to talk about today is, you know, if you think back to the last decade, um, We've really moved to a much more participatory culture, a society where uh, whether you're buying music or whether you're buying books, um, it's no longer what the bookstore or uh, record store down the street decided to carry. Instead, I can go online, I can find any music relatively or any book that I want to read. I can uh, pay for it, download it, it may in fact be free and open. Uh, in fact, there are uh, companies that predict what I might be interested, that I can participate in online book clubs in all kinds of different ways. Uh, this, of course, uh, our social life, uh, whether it's through Facebook or other things, have really changed the way that people connect and interact. And community is no longer defined simply by the geographic location where you are, but in fact, uh, what your interest is and what you want to find in the so how do we sort of leverage that participatory culture um, in education? Um, you know, if you think about the average teacher or the average principal or administrator, they're pretty isolated. The teacher spends most of her time during the day uh, not with her peers, but with kids. The same is true for the principal in the, in the school. Um, they're probably the only professional in the school that has that title. So how do we better connect them and really improve their capacity? Um, one of the efforts of the National Education Technology Plan of, in the United States has been around this effort of called Connected Online Communities of Practice Project. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what are communities of practice, uh, what are some examples of it, what are some metrics for determining if one is being uh, useful and successful, and how we might really transform the profession of education around that. And um, so this particular project, uh, as I said, is funded by the U.S. Department of Education. We also know there are many other uh, both private and public initiatives to use social networking to help educators. This particular project is a collaborative led by the American Institutes for Research. Uh, COSIN is part of it, along with the Friday Institute at North Carolina, uh, Grunwell Associates, which is a research firm, and the State Education Technology Directors Association. And uh, the reason that I think this is an important project for folks around the world to know about is that it, in fact, is a research effort so we're trying to identify best practice. And while there are 
a few communities that the project is supporting to particularly experiment with these concepts. We hope that the whole project is useful for folks around the world in finding what is best practice. Um, so why would we, wh what do we mean by an online connected community of practice? Well, first of all, um, when we talk about a community of practice, it is it has a domain. Uh, for instance, there's a shared interest, perhaps science instruction, or math instruction, or uh, special needs, or something like that, to which the members of that community are committed and in which they have shared competence. Uh, secondly, uh, we have community. In pursuing the domain, members engage in joint activities and discussions. They help each other. They share information. So the social dimension is the hallmark of a true community of practice. The third concept is that it is a practice that as a result of pursuing the domain together, members develop a repertoire of resources, experiences, stories, tools, ways of addressing teaching and learning that together define the practice of their profession or area of shared interest. And uh, when we say online, there are, in fact, uh, linkages that we can uh, bring together uh, that community of practice uh, by using technology. So that's sort of what we're talking about. Well, what are the key elements of communities of practice? First of all, they really have to have a purpose, a shared purpose. Um, and uh, they have to have leaders, uh, communities of practice, um, if you just put it out there, they often uh, run out of steam if you don't have uh, folks that are really engaged uh, in shaping the conversation and helping people connect with each other. Um, there has to be knowledge sharing. People have to contribute. You can't just have a community of what we call in the United States lurkers. There has to be trust. There has to be that sense that if I ask a question, I'm not going to be beaten up for asking a stupid or silly question, but that, uh, and that folks will actually provide their best advice. Um, there has to be a sociability aspect, the fact that people want to be, spend time together working on common problems, and that they get to know each other and like each other. And that over time, uh, the community grows and innovates. If it stagnates on just the first conversation or two conversations, um, you know, those communities wither and die. And finally, there has to be communication and integration. Um, I think, you know, stepping back and thinking about, well, what are the benefits of online communities of practice? Uh, first of all, uh, you have access to knowledge. Um, it can provide educators with opportunities to gain equitable access to the best practice uh, around the world. Um, you can share that knowledge. Um, uh, and that's really the value, I think, for educators, that they no longer have that sense of isolation, but can find best practice. They can also create knowledge that uh, you can come to a better uh, understanding of, uh, of things if we come together. That uh, while Albert Einstein had uh, great knowledge and experience, uh, the research shows that people working together in community, in fact, uh, come to a, the be a better uh, uh, decision, typically, than any one person working alone. Um, and it builds professional identity, relationships, collaboration. There's a sense of we're in it together. I'm not there alone. Um, and finally, um, it, it can provide a clear purpose and collective identity. So what are some examples in the STEM area that of, of different uh, associations and communities that are using online communities of practice? This is the Association of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, they have something called PeerLink. Uh, it's for uh, mechanical engineers to connect with other mechanical engineers and share best practice. Here's uh, another community that they have which is called their Knowledge and Community, which, which brings together different societies and communities within uh, their association. Um, 
Another example in the United States would be the National Science Teachers Association. They have a very active social networking uh, community that has uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, science teachers. Or the Math Forum uh, at Drexel University is another uh, online community of practice where, um, uh, where uh, we see lots of involvement in terms of STEM conversation, particularly math conversation. I'm going to welcome now uh, Hilary Lamont, our uh, Director of Communities of Practice, uh, and a, who's really uh, going to talk, walk us through some of the metrics of community of practice success. Take it away, Hilary. Well, um, that was a terrific introduction, Keith. Thanks very much. And I'm very excited to talk with this group. I'm sure that many of you are not only aware of and involved in communities of practice, but also fostering the health of those communities and leading many of them. So I'm looking forward to a lively conversation at the end of this presentation. I wanted to pick up from Keith's examples and um, sort of introduction to the world of communities of practice to talk specifically about what are some metrics that uh, organizations and individuals can use to gauge the success of an online community of practice. And they really fall into two categories. The first are basic metrics, things like site analytics, where you can see the number of visitors coming to the community, which areas in the community are getting the most visits, and where people are staying the longest. And uh, in discussions, the number of posts per day, how long it takes for people to get a response to questions or comments that they make. Those are all uh, fairly straightforward, um, quantitative ways to evaluate the uh, traffic and the health and robustness of the conversations happening in the community of practice. Another more um, interactive way is to select a small group of members of the community and have a focus group. Those can be either virtual or face-to-face -face if there's a, an opportunity to do that. And to get a much more in-depth and um, qualitative response to how do they feel in the community? What aspects of it do they like? What features are um, cumbersome or not fully uh, beneficial to them? And what do they wish existed in the community that doesn't? Um, and based on that focus group or uh, a similar process, uh, then going out to the entire community and having surveys where you get responses to similar questions, um, but based on some of the input that you got from the focus group can be a very good way to uh, validate and, um, and expand the response rate from those questions. So, um, for example, you can uh, ask take the list of wished uh, for features in the community and make it a, a forced choice or top three or something like that survey question and get the pulse of the entire community based on the ideas generated in the focus group. You can also add to surveys questions that get at the affective impact of people being part of the community. To what degree do they feel isolated in their practice? In many educational systems, certainly in the US and in many other countries, teachers and instructors are often pushed for time and don't have structured into their day opportunities for collaboration in their face-to-face -face, uh, professional environment. So. Um, to what degree do these online communities of practice help them reduce that sense of isolation that many educators often describe? And you can ask questions about that in a survey and give the survey on, a re on an ongoing basis repeatedly and see if the um, response to that sort of question changes over time. The second set of metrics is more advanced. And this is where we start looking at, OK, uh, so the community within itself seems robust. People are having a good response to it. But what kind of impact is it having beyond the online community of practice itself? Uh, where are people taking new ideas, new strategies, and new practices, trying them out? And what is that? Uh, what impact is that producing in their workplace or their classroom? 
Uh, some ways to get at this are text analysis of the discussions, looking for terms like I tried, ba 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 ba, or I'm struggling with, etc., or big breakthrough, you know, those kinds of terms and search on those. Um, you can also incorporate those kinds of questions into your surveys with the understanding that it is self-reported and probably would need some validation beyond the survey itself. Um, and again, you can ask questions about the community member's sense of effectiveness and efficacy as a professional in the field and domain that is the subject of the community of practice. And the second area of um, more advanced metrics is to look at the degree of community cohesion and connectedness. How much are people interacting with each other? What kinds of bonds are developing? More of uh, the recent additions to community platforms that allow for friending and other social networking kinds of interaction provide a really good way to measure the degree to which people are really forming that connectedness with each other. Um, you can look at social network analysis, a, a way of using the data captured in the community itself to analyze who are the people who are really emerging as the go-to sources who are making lots of connections and providing lots of input to the community itself. And what are some of the common pathways that people take through the community? What can that tell you about their interests or the flow of people's thought as they're engaging with the content area and domain and other people who are focused on it? And how does your community help them find routes to meaningful and useful information and uh, peer connections? As Keith mentioned, the project that we are part of is has a very active research component, and we actually have a website that's focused entirely on uh, that aspect of the work, the research about communities of practice, as well as developing a network of communities of practice. The uh, URL is connectededucators.org, and when you go to that site, you'll see a research report that is open for comment that includes information about the metrics I just mentioned and the definition and uh, scope of communities of practice that Keith uh, was describing earlier. And we also have a registry where if you're leading a community, you can uh, enter yours there. There is uh, a, an active social network um, set to accompany that site with a group in LinkedIn for managers of online communities of practice, and also an, a hashtag on Twitter, hashtag EdCOCP. So I'd really encourage any of you who are uh, leading or uh, considering leading online communities of practice, interested in the research in that area, to come to these places online and join us in our conversations. Uh, there's a, a growing and very active group there, and it's a, a wonderful conversation to be part of. So, what does this mean for us in the field of education? How can we, as educators or researchers, promote the use of online communities of practice for professional advancement, for developing our field. Um, when I think about this, I really think about it in two modes. Online communities of practice can be very uh, helpful in accessing innovation external to our organizations. Uh, I, I use communities of practice to go out and discover what other people are doing, to learn from them, to ask questions and get feedback from people who have a similar role or similar focus in their work. Another use of online communities of practice that more organizations are using now than uh, even two years ago is to use an online community of practice to integrate and support innovation internally. Sorry if you can hear that siren, they're almost gone. <laughs> um, so, sorry? They're coming to get you. Yeah, that's right. Um, so school districts are using an online community of practice to connect leaders from the district level, leaders at the school level, and, and leaders in the classroom to integrate their improvement efforts and really support each other and provide a very aligned approach to improving instruction and improving the supports for instruction across their system. Um, 
organizations, a lot of corporations are using online communities of practice to network professional knowledge across a very distributed group of people who have a, a common mission and responsibilities tied to it that can benefit from learning from their peers in, in other parts of the company. Um, so how can we think about those two modes and what are some levels of community of practice that one might uh, target in developing something similar to what I just described? Um, in this, the work of Tom Carroll at the National Council for Teaching in America's Future is very helpful. He really gives us three models to think about in thinking of communities of practice. The first, he says, is really a legacy of, at least in the United States, the way education has been structured for a very long time. And that is the network of artisans. People are really acting individually. They have a craft that they are developing. Um, and they go to the online space to access valuable resources, talk with people who might be meaningful, uh, have meaningful input from them. Um, and that's about the extent of it. They take that information, those resources, and they individually apply it to their practice um, without a lot of collaboration uh, in terms of application to the, to the profession itself. Uh, so this group of people might be interested in uh, different types of wood and the kinds of um, attributes they have and what they would be best for and less effective at. But when it comes to using that information, they're probably going to do it fairly individually. A second level comes when you start thinking about artisans in a guild. And here Tom splits it out into two uh, levels of connectedness. One is the connectedness of an independent team. The metaphor he uses is the figure skating team at, a, at the Olympics. I thought that this group of woodworkers exemplified some of the characteristics he speaks about. Um, everybody is working in a shared environment, and they're working to develop their craft um, and supporting each other in that. But when it comes to actually doing the craft or performing the, the skating routine, they do that on a very individual level. Um, very many communities of practice exemplify this kind of connectedness. People do work together when they're in that online community of practice, but when they turn to their face-to-face -face world, they're again individually working on an individual basis uh, in roles that are very similar to each other and without a lot of connectedness in that part of the work. And the third level is the interdependent team. This is a barn raising in um, in Pennsylvania. Everybody on this team has a role that is dependent on other people for their success. The metaphor that Tom Carroll uses is the uh, hockey team, ice hockey team in the Olympics. So they practice together, they access resources, they support each other in developing their work, and when it comes to actually doing the work or performing in the, in the case of the ice hockey team, they're also dependent on each other, and they're doing that work as a team. I think when we think about uh, communities of practice within organizations particularly, getting to the interdependent team level really takes organizations to a higher level of functioning and makes the best use of the human resources we have when we're not duplicating roles, but rather creating roles that are um, dependent on each other and able to benefit from the work that each individual is contributing to the overall collective. So some of the challenges or issues right now that we see in online communities of practice are um, a sort of healthy tension, I think, between or communities of practice that are growing organically from uh, dedicated individuals who find each other and decide to develop community to uh, continue and um, expand the conversations that they've had that uh, have been useful to them. Some of these are communities that have grown from people who met at a conference really clicked and had a, a really uh, meaningful exchange on a professional level at the conference and then didn't want it to end. So they put together a Ning or uh, even a hashtag on Twitter and kept the conversation going in the, in the social networking and online mode uh, and developed huge communities of practice from that origin. 
The other mode is that the community of practice that is really designed, led, and facilitated by an organization. Um, COSIN is in the midst of developing an online community of practice called accessfored.net, which is focused on innovative approaches to providing access to technology for learning. and. Um, resulted from our analysis of the world of online communities of practice and where we saw there was a gap in the needs being met of particular professionals. So in our case, it's directed at district level leaders who are um, moving their organizations to providing more access. And we didn't find many online communities of practice that were serving that particular group. And we decided that we uh, it was relevant to our mission and we could play a valuable role there. Um, there are very different pathways to success for those kind, different kinds of communities of practice. And as you're looking for meaningful communities of practice to serve your professional work, I'm sure you'll find both or you may be part of both already. Um, the second uh, set of issues then is given that we have these two worlds of community of practice, how do they benefit each other? And how do we prevent creating silos in cyberspace um, in such a connected environment? It makes sense that we should be able to find if there are conversations that are meaningful around inquiry-based instruction in physics in one community and another, how do we connect those and help those conversations find each other rather than having them in two separate communities of practice and leaving it to chance whether people interested in that topic are going to be able to find all of the uh, meaningful sources in online communities of practice relevant to that um, topic. That is a great area of research and a very strong focus of the Connected Online Communities of Practice project that Keith and I have both mentioned and that is uh, the focus of the ConnectedEducators.org website. So uh, Gavin encouraged us to end with a call to action. And our question is, how will you use the digital space for your professional and organizational effectiveness? Um, how will you use it as an individual professional development tool, or how do you already? How can you use it as an organizational leadership tool? What role do social networks such as LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook play in that world versus hosted communities, um, such as some of the examples that, that Keith mentioned? And how can you use online communities of practice to support your HP Catalyst work? Well, a good place to start is the navigator for HP Catalyst. This is a very, um, I think, advanced tool and a wonderfully designed suite of um, opportunities to talk with each other, to showcase your work, and to find people across the consortia in the Catalyst grant that are doing meaningful work um, that, are, that might be relevant to your pursuits. So if you haven't already, I would definitely encourage you to um, join this community and become an active member of it. I think it can only benefit um, not only the work you're doing with the HP Catalyst grant, but your work more generally. <laughs>